Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew Copson, Chief Executive of Humanist UK. I'd like to welcome you to our event this evening and hand immediately over to our chair, Samira Ahmed. Hello, good evening and good morning, depending on where you are in the world. I know that you're all over the world, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm a journalist and I often do stuff for Humanists UK. And what we're going to do tonight is have a sort of bit of a scene set about the state of secularism and the freedom of religion of belief at such an interesting time in the world with Joe Biden about to be um, inaugurated and yet so many other issues still um, in, are very much in flux. Um, two other speakers as well, I'll introduce them all. Just be aware we're going to have a bit of a discussion and then the, the second half hour is hopefully going to be entirely your questions and you can submit them using the Q&A tab. Um, try to keep them relatively short, tell us who you are if you'd like and if you want to direct your question at anyone in particular and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can and if you're tweeting the hashtag is secularism in 2021. Um, so Andrew Copson, as you'll know, of course, the Chief Executive of Humanists UK. Uh, Dr. Nazila uh, Garnier is Associate Professor in International Human Rights Law at the University of Oxford. Um, she's one of the experts who sort of sits in so many important bodies on freedom of expression of belief. Um, her research spans freedom of religion or belief and expression, women's rights, minority rights in the Middle East in particular. Uh, she's been invited to address UN expert seminars um, and has acted as a human rights consultant and expert for a number of governments um, for the UN, for UNESCO, the Commonwealth, the Council of Europe and the EU. And Professor Parik Madud is founding director of the Centre for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship. He's a fellow of the British Academy and is the co-founding editor of the International Journal Ethnicities. Um, his books include Secularism, Religion and Multicultural Citizenship. Tolerance, Intolerance and Respect, Religion in the Liberal State, and Essays on Secularism and Multiculturalism. And he's been an advisor to the Muslim Council of Britain and has served in the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life. So a huge amount of expert knowledge and experience on this panel. Andrew, you're going to start by setting the scene for us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Samira. The, um, the idea of this event uh, originally last year was um, to, for it to take place three years after the publication of a book that I wrote for Oxford University Press called Secularism, Politics, Religion and Freedom. Things have moved on a bit and because of the pandemic we were delayed, so it's now been almost four years since um, that book. In that book, which was an introduction to secularism, its historical development and what different people think about it, um, there was a chapter on current challenges. And four years later, I think it's interesting and a good opportunity um, to discuss how those challenges have developed and what the current uh, prospects for secularism in a world, um, though only four years on, as Samira said, much changed um, and with many uh, interesting and relevant developments having occurred. So I'll start by just reminding everybody um, what we mean by secularism in this context, because the word is used often very generically to mean a sort of state of being non-religious. We're using it today in the political context. Um, this secularism is a way of ordering nation states, communities, and it has three main aspects. The first is the separation of religious institutions from the institutions of the state and the lack of any domination of one set of those institutions by another. So that's really something that most people think of as uh, constitutive of, of secularism, the separation of religious institutions and state institutions. And no mastery of one over the other. But that's not all secularism is, at least in most contemporary definitions. A second aspect of secularism is that the secular state will attempt to secure for those within its borders, its citizens and others too, the maximum freedom of thought, conscience and religion or belief that is possible in, lines, uh, in line with the limitations of the freedoms um, and human rights of others. So the secular state will actively attempt to uh, remove barriers to and to promote, defend and advance that freedom in particular. The third aspect of secularism, and this is really the most recent that's developed to become uh, part of the aspirations of, of secularist platforms and secularist politicians, the third aspect of secularism is that there should be no discrimination, no state discrimination against anyone on grounds of their religion or non-religious uh, worldview. So um, we see this mostly embodied in the uh, equality directives of the European Union, but it's also in other laws um, around the world now, and an important part of um, what secularists uh, say they want to see uh, in, in, in uh, constitutions, uh, legal situations, um, and governments. So separation of institutions, maximising of freedom of religion or belief, and uh, an active uh, policing 
um, to eliminate discrimination on regional belief grounds. In the book, if we go to the next slide, I looked at um, four particular uh, locuses for um, discussing secularism, and I think probably there'll be at least some of what we discussed this evening, so I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them briefly. France is the first, of course, um, a uh, paradigmatic uh, secular state for uh, many people. Um, uh, actually, its secularism is, 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 is very individual and peculiar to um, uh, France, um, but no doubt it is uh, an important secular state in the world today that we'll be looking at. The United States, a different sort of secularism from France. If in France secularism is about protecting the citizens from religion, protecting the state from religion, in America it's almost the other way around. It's uh, secularism in the United States is more about protecting religion from the state. It's more a religious liberty type of secularism. In India, um, obviously the biggest secular state in the world, the secularism is different again. It exists to advance all of those three aspects that we said were uh, definitive of secularism at the beginning, but it's more of a, um, a sort of multicultural secularism or attempts to be in spirit. Um, it's more uh, the state protecting everyone from everyone else, you know, trying to hold the line um, in a context of diversity. So there are three uh, specific states with very different qualities of secularism. And then the fourth type of secularism that I discussed in the book, and which I think we'll probably end up discussing at least to some extent this evening, is secularism where it's not in the constitution, it's not in the law, it's not official, um, but it's a sort of secularism de facto. Um, some people say that the UK, for example, even though constitutionally it's the most Christian state in the world, in many respects is also very secular in the way governments behave. Governments don't seek you know, religious uh, instruction as to how they should legislate, for example, very often. And many Western states today are de facto secular in that sense. So that's secularism in some of its uh, varieties. When it comes to the international situation, I think that the, the best uh, example of international secularism comes from um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the right to freedom of religion or belief that is spelled out there. So this is just that right in, in words. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others in public and in private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. And it's important to remember um, that in the language of international uh, human rights, the phrase religion or belief includes everybody. So, you know, whatever um, beliefs you're going around uh, in the world with, however you choose to live on the basis of your values, your beliefs, whether religious or not religious, they are included, they are comprehended within the context of this right. So on top of the various national secularisms, that's a sort of international secularism as well. The last thing I'll do then is to uh, remind us of some of the opponents of secularism, um, both in the past and today, because that's where one of the areas where um, things have changed most quickly in the last three to four years. In very few parts of the world has the situation improved. There have been some parts where it has, for example, um, where uh, some, in some states where Islamic law has been replaced with um, secular criminal and civil law, but mostly in the, in the world, um, the opposition to secularism that I identified just over three years ago in the last chapter of this book has intensified, grown, developed, increased um, in its severity. So you have the theocrats, obviously, um, theocrats are you know, people who believe that their one particular religion should rule the roost, should dictate the law. Um, the prime example in modern terms of this has, also, has always been um, Iran. Um, in history, of course, you can find uh, many examples of both Christian and Muslim um, wannabe theocracies, but today it's often Iran. But this is also true uh, of the way many American NGOs behave outside of their own country, internationally, for example, um, pursuing uh, theocratic agendas when it comes to the way they export uh, or attempt to export um, their values together with American money around the world. Established church advocates, um, this is uh, particularly prominent in, in Western European countries like England and in Denmark, um, where opponents of secularism say that instead of um, being um, impartial in matters of religion, the state should sort of lead from the front with a particular strong religious identity and then gather everyone else um, under that umbrella as a sort of multi-faith protectionism. Atheist totalitarians, um, the flip side of the coin uh, of theocrats in many ways. Um, this is an area where things have developed a lot in the last uh, three to four years. Only tomorrow our parliament in Westminster will be um, debating the genocide of the Uyghur people that the Chinese state is implementing 
um, currently. Um, that's become a much uh, bigger theme, the, the implacable hostility of China towards any beliefs that conflict with its own agenda has become more and more obvious in the last three to four years. Ethnic conservatives, um, people who say that national identity shouldn't be secular, but instead should be wedded to certain other characteristics, um, race, uh, religion or belief, ethnicity. This is another area where things have um, developed in the last few years. We see right now um, in India, the way that uh, Hindu nationalism in the government of Modi and the wider social and cultural movement that that political movement is part of has continued to cause severe oppression um, for all minorities really in, in, in most parts of India, but certainly Muslims and non-religious people, especially organized non-religious people, humanists. Liberal relativists are a, are a very um, specific Western threat. These are people, I characterize them in the book, who sort of um, don't want to defend secularism too much because they sort of think that it might not be liberal enough. After all, you don't want to tell people what to do. Could secularism be a bit hard? Is it a bit off? You know, um, those, um, there are sort of internal self-doubt um, in many secular states that is, um, can be quite crippling for the defense of secularism as a political settlement. And then a certain type of multiculturalist. And I think this is definitely true in many states that have been de facto secular, like England in, in the past, especially its education system, for example, there's a certain type of multiculturalist who instead of seeing society as um, something that is composed of uh, individuals who have human rights, see society as something that is composed of communities that ought to be treated as the unit um, of social organization and make arguments for uh, developments, for example, such as um, the almost total religionization of education systems so that people get divided into um, different silos. Um, this is something that you see constitutional uh, in countries, uh, some countries like Indonesia, for, for example, and historically in, in, in the Netherlands, this was the case. Um, no one quite today in secular states in the West uh, recommends that people should formally be assigned to a religion or belief and spend their whole life from school to other common instances in that silo alone. Um, but there are multicultural tendencies that argue against secularity in various aspects of the constitution. In all um, six of these areas, in all sorts of different countries from the United States um, to India, um, from Egypt um, to Malaysia, and in every country that I've discussed, um, these opponents are more severe and growing uh, more powerful all the time. And certainly in the last four years, uh, in the countries that I've mentioned, this has been very evident. Fantastic, Andrew. That's a, it was a bit rapid. Concise. You said, you know, I was actually, I, I was typing the, um, the little list, the categories are really interesting. Um, I want to ask um, um, Dr. Nazila Agania first to respond, whether it's specifically to anything Andrew said or to set out a little bit of your own stall on the issues around secularism right now. And then I'll ask Tarek to do the same. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed um, Andrew's presentation and indeed also his book because it really sets out um, the secularism litmus test, let's say, for freedom of religion or belief. So, um, you know, the, the insistence on tolerance, on openness, on protection for all, on the possibility of people changing their religion or belief, you know, from religion to non-religion, but also vice versa or between religions, um, and the insistence that everybody should be able to manifest that religion or belief is, is really standing up for freedom of religion or belief as upheld in, in international standards. So uh, we have the understanding that freedom of religion or belief is for everyone since the drafting of, um, at least since the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1947 and its adoption in 1948. We can say that freedom of religion or belief is, um, you know, the uh, sort of standard human rights. It's, it's of long pedigree. Um, and um, it's a human right par excellence. Yet it keeps getting, yet we keep having to insist that it's a human right for everybody. And, you know, I've been uh, working in, in this uh, area, doing research and teaching in this area for some 25 years. And one keeps having to go back to the drawing board and saying, this right is universal. This is not a, a right that is to be pitted against, let's say, freedom of expression. And it's, uh, you know, let's choose one or the other. It's not freedom of religion or belief or gender rights. It's not freedom of religion or belief or freedom of expression. It's not freedom of religion or belief or child rights. It's one of the human rights. But the reason why these 
uh, one has to keep pushing back and insisting going back to the drawing board on this, whether at the international level or, you know, every time there's a, a mandate holder appointed at a regional level or the national level is because this human right, we can say, becomes confused um, because of its relationship with the state. And also, I, I think something that is emphasized a lot by um, in Andrew's book, by political culture. So this is never a, an arena that is static, because even if, um, you know, the state religion belief relationship is like set out in the ideal way that, you know, sometimes lawyers have put in or academics have put in their writings that this is the perfect model constitution regarding religion or belief uh, at the national level. But despite that, and as Andrew's examples um, uh, play out, um, it is not only the model that rescues all the, uh, you know, rescues it all and saves it all. It's also the political culture, which is also changing and is also standing as a buttress against electoral gain, populism, and power struggle. So, you know, just this, around the same time that Andrew was writing his very short introduction with two colleagues, uh, again with OUP, we were writing a very long introduction to freedom of religion or belief. Uh, I'm sure Andrew's book is much more popular and certainly it captured a lot of detail uh, in, those, um, in, the, in the short chapters. But, um, it, it plays out, it says that, you know, when, when it comes to freedom of religion or belief and refugees, there are evolving, constantly evolving challenges. When it comes to freedom of religion or belief and child rights, um, there are constantly evolving challenges that we need to be alert to. Um, and um, the way you laid it out, Andrew, was almost like, you know, uh, there could be full secular, um, um, celebration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I suspect that you might not say quite the same thing about the 1993 general comment on freedom of religion or belief. Um, because there, um, the International Com the Human Rights Committee said, is interpreting Article 18 on freedom of religion or belief. And they don't say that um, there cannot be a state religion relationship. I mean, this is where the pragmatism of the international community comes in, that you look around the world in 1993, in 1948, in 1966, and if you say that you can only sign up to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Freedom of Religion or Belief if there is no state religion relationship, you know, you, it's a losing battle. So instead, what they, they don't say, they don't speak about the model for protecting this right, they insist on what the right is. And that, that right includes um, the right to change religion or belief. And importantly, it says that um, if there are any limitations to, manif to, to manifesting, to, you know, in the public uh, presentation of religion or belief, um, if there are any limitations on the basis of morality, that should come from many traditions, not a single tradition. So again, that is a protection saying that you cannot use religious, the state religion relationship and religious law and through the back door of morality insist that everybody become uniform. Uniformity is not a protection of, of um, human rights. So, um, they also say that if there's any restriction uh, and limitation on freedom of religion or belief, effectively the, the onus is on the state to show that this will not lead to discrimination and it will not lead to discrimination against others against the minorities against those that are not in power against you know not just what is the norm in that society or the majoritarian perspective but against all so i think this we need to be constantly vigilant and aware of the minority we need to be aware that um, religion um, and state may um, cooperate in order to, on the one hand, gain legitimacy, on the other hand, to push through uh, populist uh, ga gains and infringe human rights. Uh, but I'll just end with saying that um, it's very interesting to look at secularism as a litmus test on freedom of religion or belief. And as a check, when we look around the world, what is the status of freedom of religion or belief? Hum um, the, this 
uh, secular test can often indicate what is the position of minorities, what is the position of those that are not in power, what is the position of nonconformists. And it also protects religious minorities. So perhaps that's not the aim, but effectively um, they often stand together. And maybe I'll just stop there. Fantastic. Mozilla, thank you so much. Um, and just to remind those um, who uh, perhaps joined uh, a couple of minutes in, uh, you can submit questions via the Q&A tab. We're going to be taking um, audience questions shortly, but our panelists are just setting out sort of the, their general kind of approach to thinking about secularism. So, um, Tariq, um, we'll do that to you. Thank you, Samira. Yes, so I'll set out my approach in a, in a few minutes, which goes something like this. And, and my focus is very much on Western Europe. Um, political secularism seemed a settled issue in Western Europe um, for a long time, you know, for the best part of the 20th century, for instance. And it was probably really just in the 1990s that it began to uh, have some debate and discussion, th uh, theorizing and controversy. And there are a number of reasons for that, but I think in Western Europe, perhaps differently elsewhere, but in Western Europe, the, it's primarily because of multiculturalism, by which I mean not just the presence of a variety of ethnic and religious and uh, racialized groups, but an understanding of majority minority relations, which is, isn't reducible to toleration, which of course has been the classical standard uh, view that accompanies secularism, that religious people should tolerate each other and should tolerate atheists and so on. But these central concept for multiculturalists is that of recognition that identity groups, ethno-religious communities, as well as other kinds of uh, ethno-cultural communities should not just be tolerated, but should be allowed to uh, be part of the shared public space. That includes the political space, media, uh, public education, uh, shared uh, civil society, and uh, other kinds of uh, institutions, obviously political and so on, that ethnic minorities should be able to present their identity in that space. They shouldn't have to privatize it and be excluded from that space because a majority identity uh, has a monopoly of, over that space. And of course, the problem for religious, uh, sorry, for secularism then becomes, well, how to handle the presence of public religious identities. And this of course has been most uh, forcefully and controversially um, arisen in Western Europe through the presence of um, new Muslim settlements. Amongst the various consequences, I think, two of the most important are firstly, what kind of political secularism do we actually have in Western Europe? You know, what has it come to be? Because obviously political secularism, just like anything else, is not a, a static idea or a static uh, vision, or let alone static institutional arrangements. So what is, what is the current one? Uh, what has uh, evolved up to today? And a lot of the thinking amongst theorists till they began to uh, engage with it fully was basically secularism was of two types. And um, Andrew mentioned them. One is the kind of American uh, religious liberty uh, type of secularism and the other, the French Republican uh, governance of public space and exclusion of religious identities from public uh, public space. So one of the first things as I got engaged with this topic was the realization that neither of those two approaches, the American and the French, applies to Britain, or indeed Western Europe in generally with, you know, the exception of France itself. And so if we look at the kinds of uh, secularism that we have in, you know, in, 
in Britain, in Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Nordic countries, and so on. I characterize this as moderate secularism because in none of these countries do we have an absolute separation between politics and religion or church or churches and, and the state. Separation is important insofar as it does inform uh, the design of institutions and uh, political and legal norms, but it's more accurately captured in the idea of mutual autonomy. That is to say, religion and politics have different, uh, are different modes of authority and they can support each other and that can be a good thing, it's not, it's not a bad thing, but they shouldn't dominate each other. So certainly for the secularists, uh, religious authorities should not dominate politics, law, state, and public, public life. And yet this moderate secularism, uh, and therefore the kind of connection or disconnection that there is between religion and the state has to be evaluated not just in terms of ideas about freedom, but also, and this is what I say is actually the case, I'm not recommending it, I'm saying it's actually the case, though I do uh, think it's, it's a good thing, has to be evaluated in terms of a notion of public good and public identities and their institutional accommodation. So it's not simply about rights of individual freedom and conscience. The second implication that this Sorry, has, just to warn you, because of we got we're into the last half hour now, and I'd really right. like to get to questions soon. Okay. So do you finish your point, but just be aware we'll get going okay. with questions then. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Samira. Um, all right. So the second implication, very briefly, is how to extend what I've described as moderate political secularism to include the new religious minorities, not just in terms of beliefs or even practice, but a sense of citizenship and national identity. And I call that multiculturalizing political secularism. And it's part, I think, of a broad sweep of rethinking racism and anti-racism, rethinking equality and inclusion, and rethinking citizenship and national belonging. I'll, I'll stop that. Fantastic. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many interesting ways to look at this. So I want to dive straight into questions, combining sort of points I think we'd always want to discuss with some of the great comments that are already coming in. So the first is, you know, we're speaking two days before um, Joe Biden's inauguration. And, you know, in theory, people are talking about, oh, he's going to turn the clock back on all things. He's going to lift the Muslim ban. Um, let me just read you the way that it's been phrased by Colin Challen. Is there a pushback against secularism, which is closely related to the nationalist trend? A Trump supporter last week had a banner saying, Jesus is my Lord, Trump is my president. Biden has been very clear about his Catholic faith as if to neutralize Trump's alignment with the evangelical right. Is there a view that secularism is not a value which supports a strong national identity? So all of you take it as you will around what the election of Joe Biden means and, and how far, I mean, I'm interested in how religion, it's hard to imagine a, a, an, over, an openly humanist president, for example. Who wants to go first? Andrew, do you want to dive in? Well, I think that American, I mean, the, what we're seeing at the moment is just the latest episode in a long uh, chain of controversies about American secularism. American secularism was controversial from the day after it was adopted, you know, that from, from the adoption of the First Amendment onwards, um, there was a national movement that said that the Constitution should be rewritten to include Christianity, it should be rewritten to include God, it should be rewritten to in, include Jesus. And there's a remarkable organisational cultural continuity between the campaigners who are seeking that throughout the 19th century and the 20th century, and today, in some cases, the same organisations um, that are organising under under those banners and it's been rightly termed I think Christian nationalism Christian nationalism is one aspect of um with Trump uh the, the movement that attached itself to, to Donald Trump and that still exists it existed before him it'll exist after him and I think what's distinctive about Joe Biden's approach is that he embodies the American secularist tradition um which I often Catholics do more than more than some other Christians in um, the United States because they've been historically the victims of social prejudice in many respects. JFK was famously the first Catholic uh, president. Joe Biden has been um, the second. So it's almost as hard for a Catholic to get to the top of American politics as it would be for a, a, a non-Christian to do so. And what Joe Biden has said, obviously, is that he has his uh, Catholic beliefs um, about, for example, 
um, the status of the of, of the fetus and and and, and uh, certain concepts of human dignity, but he doesn't think it's appropriate in a plural society to impose by statute those beliefs on others, and that's a sort of classic American secularist position, um, really. Um, in terms of what, and, and you know, I think that's just part of the late and the long, uh, long uh, American secularist story. In what he can do in, in roll back to roll back um, some of the attacks on the idea that the American state should act in a um, in a way that respects pluralism rather than imposes one certain Christian identity on people or eth one ethnic identity on, on people by virtue of being American. He, he obviously can roll back all the executive orders that refer to national and international um, uh, rules, for example, on preventing uh, funding going to public health measures across the world if they include abortion in them, for example, which is one of the one of Donald Trump's actions. He can roll back um, stuff like the ability of federal funding to go to organisations that discriminate in employment or service provision on, on religious grounds, all of which has happened under under Trump. But what he probably uh, can't do um, is act as an effective check on the erosion of secularism at the state level. And it's, it's through litigation strategies at the state level um, to you know, put Christ, Christian symbols in public buildings, in public courts, to introduce prayer in, in local schools, Christian prayer, of course. You know, those things that are, uh, it's a flood of legislation coming out the, at the state level that he can't do much about. And of course, the Supreme Court uh, justices are mostly now um, not in what you think of as traditional American uh, secularist um, position. So he, 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 he's definitely got the right values for me um, in terms of wanting to bring back the, the, the American secularist tradition into American public life. But whether he can do it or not, I think is very difficult. I think um, the, the American Christian nationalist tendency is very powerful in their country, it always has been. Okay, who wants to go next? Well, I mean, I New think another thing that occurs a lot in the US is, of course, the cult of personality. So it's not surprising in a, in a culture, in a society where there is so much obsession about the personality and, uh, you know, bring, making um, the figurehead bigger than life. Uh, but I agree that what will happen is the checks on the system. And one of the checks on the system um, will be the U.S. playing uh, its role in the international community once again. So already there, it, it's indicated that the U.S. will join the Human Rights Council again. I think one innovation that would be really welcome um, is around the world we have a number of um, ambassadors, a number of post holders for freedom of religion or belief. Uh, all of them have been foreign policy post holders. And we don't have any uh, ambassadors on freedom of religion or belief that can both look within the state and internationally. And since the US has had this US Commission on International Religious Freedom that has largely over the decades it has run, tried to maintain its cross party um, legitimacy and uh, play uh, uh, you know, uh, a strong role in um, identifying freedom of religion belief violations, whether for believers or non-believers or uh, majority or minority, um, it would be very interesting to develop um, a role that looks at problems domestically and uh, internationally regarding religion or belief, because that way you're strengthened in your legitimacy and you can delve into the minutiae and the challenges that constantly arise in every sphere regarding discrimination um, and violations of freedom of religion or belief. What's really interesting, Nazila, is that you answer the question with a solution, whereas I was thinking practically what's going to happen just with my news head. So it's good, it's good to actually be looking and thinking creatively. And I should reassure everyone that this event finishes in 55 minutes, not in 25 minutes. So sorry for panicking anyone who thought they weren't getting the full, the full secular experience. Um, Tarek, over to you. Uh, thanks. Um, well, Biden said that on day one, he will, um, uh, you know, ban the Muslim ban, the ban of Muslims arriving from a number of Muslim majority, majority countries. And of course, that's right. And I would say one of the strongest features of American secularism is the anti-discrimination character. Um, in, many, in many respects, American secularism is a kind of hands-off secularism, but one thing that it's strong on 
is uh, sensitivity to discrimination. And the way that Trump uh, roughshod over that was a complete violation of the spirit of the constitution, if, even if he was allowed legally to get away with it. But of course, even to get away with it, he had to uh, express it in general terms. He had to take words like Muslim out of his original formulation. Uh, beyond that, I mean, Biden uh, um, has said uh, at various times uh, in his campaign and so on, in his outreach to Muslims and so on, that he wants to bring Muslims in to uh, be full Americans, to be American citizens, to be uh, participants in uh, the electoral process, but you know, in civil society and in shaping uh, American politics and so on. And if you like, the ultimate kind of expression of that is American national identity. What is it to be American? Um, what is the vision? Because America, of course, is a country founded on a vision. It has an idea about itself, uh, which of course is partly you know, mythological or if you like, partly aspirational, but it is, an, it is a, a kind of idea about justice, but also a sense of providence. You know, this, this shining city uh, on the hill, a beacon of liberty, but also, as it were, you know, in God we trust and uh, God bless America. And I think one of the things that uh, has been happening, was happening in the 20th century was people like um, President Reagan and others started talking about America not just being a Christian country or a Christian idea, but a Judeo-Christian one which I thought was very interesting. Of course, it's discursive rather than in terms of policy. And then Obama said, well, surely a time will come when we think of America as a Judeo-Christian Islamic country. And I think that's right, that America has this idea of um, hyphenated identities. You know, you can be Irish American, Catholic American, Hindu American and so on. And I think uh, the progressive side of American politics should develop this idea of a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-faith American identity. Thank you. Um, and I should say, I know there are more questions uh, with a, a particular focus on issues in America, which I'll come back to, but just to sort of discuss some of the kind of big um, issues that are out there. I wanted to ask about the role of culture wars was something we saw happening very much in the States, um, but it's definitely something which is happening more in the UK. What is the state of culture wars and how far are they a, an issue that um, humanists have to deal with in the whole issue of, of trying to... I think, uh, I think actually the dimension of the, the culture war dimension, if you want to call it that, actually cuts both for and against secularism in different contexts. I mean, you can make a strong argument that, you know, secularism in France is on one side of the culture wars and secularism in, you know, the UK is on another side of the, of the, of, of the culture wars, really, because um, I think it, it depends, you know... The, I mean, Tarek might say more about this later, but if 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 you're if you're from a very strongly secular uh, country and your national identity is very uh, strongly secular, as against other things, um, that can equally be weaponized as religious identities and religious nationalism can be weaponized against others who don't share um, that view. I think in the UK it's very difficult because because there's a um, because the UK isn't a secular state and specifically England, of course, has a, has an established. Uh, church um, and because the established church in England is woven into so many aspects of our public uh, life um, invisibly sometimes but certainly um, it, it is a series of uh, implicit assumptions um, I think it, it 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 complicates the whole question of, of freedom of religion and belief um, generally and of secularism specifically now said earlier about the um uh, the success of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, and that's true. But even there, um, there's a drift towards um, international religious freedom, meaning talking about the rights of Christians at the expense of everybody else. And I think too often that's one of the things that um, many Christian defenders of freedom, religion, have been uh, have been guilty of. So yeah, I think that like like any idea, um, freedom, religion, and belief can be weaponized against minorities and religious freedom can be used as a stick to beat minorities with as much as it can be used as a shield to protect them from discrimination. And just a specific question because it seems relevant now, Charles Bailey has asked, because um, we know that Humanist UK did 
write to the Prime Minister to express concern about Fiona Bruce's appointment. Has there been any reaction to these concerns from Member Town? Yeah, we expressed our concerns before she was appointed, actually, when her name was was in the running, um, because we've been uh, working really in lockstep with the UK government and the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office in their promotion of freedom of religion belief um, internationally. And the government's been very supportive of humanists persecuted abroad. Um, but no, we, they ha we haven't had any official response. And parliamentarians have also written to, to the prime minister now to say, you know, isn't there, sh shouldn't a more suitable appointment be made but they haven't had a response either i think that's quite routine these days that the government's not very responsive um uh, to criticism in that sense but yeah it's a big disappointment thank you uh, tara did you want to go next on this? yes i mean if we'd been having this conversation a year ago and someone said oh what about cultural wars i think certainly i would i think we'd all but i would uh think that we were talking about muslims Mm. about what Muslims wear, about um, whether Muslims are uh, sufficiently uh, identifying with the communities around them, with the broader British way of life, um, whether, you know, what are Muslim views on gender and sexuality. Um, and what's interesting now is if you mention the word cultural wars, it's about... Um, the legacy of slavery and racism, you know, in the last few months um, about, um, I live in Bristol, I'm sitting here in Bristol, and of course we became the epicenter of that movement for a few days um, when the statue of one of the slave owners, one of the big famous slave owners of Bristol, Edward Colston, was taken off its pedestal and thrown into the harbour. And that's now become a big national, indeed international, international debate. And it's part of something larger called uh, decolonizing uh, Britain, decolonizing our ways of thinking and the way we look at history and so on. Um, and one of the reactions to that, when, you know, one of the positive reactions to that has been, so I listen to a lot of Radio 4 and I read The Observer and The Guardian. And I see say, that, which are considered relatively liberal and even left wing in some cases, certainly the Guardian. So. Right. And what I've noticed over the last few months is a lot of programs and a lot of, you know, features and interviews and uh, coverage of issues of concern to black people raised by black people, programs hosted by black people, programs uh, looking at aspects of black culture that had been marginalized um, and s investigating the presence of black people in British history and so on. I suppose I then asked myself, ah, oh, when we next get back to Muslims being at the center of cultural wars, which can't be very far away, I don't believe, will the Guardian, the Observer and Radio 4 respond in a similar way by saying, oh, we must now commission a lot of programs about how Muslims are connected to Britain today, in the near past, the long past. What are their sensibilities and concerns about uh, current affairs and about their experience of microaggression and the way that they are marginalized and uh, stereotyped and so on? And this then becomes the challenge for, uh, for secularism, because for a lot of secularists, they would say, no, no, don't bring Muslims onto the BBC. We don't, we don't want that. Be no, not, be not because they're anti-Muslim, I, I, I don't want to imply that, but because they have a view that religion should be at the margin of public life and should not run through it in the way that anti-racism may do so, black cultural identity may do so, but religious identity should not. That's what I meant. Well, I don't think that's right. And I don't think it's right. To, I mean, it might be, it might happen that way, but I don't think it would be necessarily for the reasons that Tarek says. I mean, I think it's important to remember that in spite of um, what I said at the beginning about many Western states being sort of de facto secular and what Tarek said about there being a sort of secularism in Britain, that we're not a secular state, actually. And I don't think that um, we can... Uh, draw conclusions about the behavior of British political and media culture and say that they're the behaviors of secular political culture because we don't have a secular uh, political culture. So I don't think that that is right. I think it'd be 
you know, France is a more interesting example to talk about from that point of view, where just, you know, any um, consideration um, of, of, um, uh, of the religious identities of people as being parts of their experience or parts of their disadvantage or parts of their advantages completely off the agenda. And so too, of course, is, 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 is um, racial and ethnic um, mm. uh, distinguishing factors in France as well. I mean, they're consistent across that. Well, I'm, I'm glad my, you raised it's France. It's not my secularism anyway. Yeah. What, um, what I just wonder, Nazila, if, if France is a good example to talk about at this point because of the way that the secular state and the concepts of identity work there. If you're talking about a culture war, France in, in a way is going through one. And I mean, it merged today that um, there's a kind of French um, equivalent of a kind of Muslim council, which has put out a statement saying that... Um, French values and Muslim values, well, I'll read it to you. It said, this charter reaffirms the compatibility of the Muslim faith with the principles of the Republic, including secularism and the commitment of French Muslims to their complete citizenship. What's your take on the culture wars, perhaps particularly due to France, Nazila? Well, uh, this also reminds me of when the Sheikh Al-Azhar and the foreign minister of France were on a TV interview together saying that the hijab is not a Muslim requirement is that uh, sometimes politicians uh, think we are so simple and that, you know, uh, uh, a symbolic presence uh, of, you know, of course, two, two people of, of uh, great symbolism, um, that that will win the argument. But I think there's much more complexity here. Um, and uh, I also want to ask uh, very often where the values debate comes up, what do values do to, to human rights? Um, you know, can people manifest their religion or belief uh, on a non-discriminatory basis in France? Why are we focused on one symbol and not on others? Well, can I ask as well um, about, well, China and uh, the Uyghur Muslim seems to be the other really significant developing news story around secularism and religion. And it's been raised already um, by some of you, and it's certainly been raised by audience questions. How do you look at that issue? Certainly the way the Chinese government has put out those statements about um, trying to save Uyghur women from yeah, I mean, <laughs> sexist Islam. Yeah. Well, somehow we seem to talk a lot about the empowerment of women, except when it comes to questions of religion or belief. And suddenly this is the only space where saving women and not empowering them becomes the way to do it. And we should just sweep that aside. And, and say that people know their own issues and their own um, uh, battles uh, themselves. They don't need rescuing. They need to be listened to and heard. Andrew, I interrupted you, I think. No, not at all. No, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I was going to say the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it should be as on law. It should be as inappropriate. It should be, we should, secularists should see it as, as inappropriate to ban the hijab um, in China as it is to require it in Iran. I mean, I just don't, I, I've never understood why, pe why people should see, should, should operate a double standard there at all. I don't, like you say, it's, it's actually about the individual human rights and choices of, 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 of men and women. women but also going back to your original chart with the different categories, I was thinking of liberal relativists um, and thinking of um, one of the speakers who's spoken at the um, the Rosalind Franklin lecture, Angela Saini uh -huh. talked about her concerns about World Hijab Day, which was this event that was set up to encourage, you know, non-Muslim women to kind of show solidarity. But actually, the agenda underneath, I think it's Saudi-backed, is about, is, is of concern to many, many secularists. Yeah, I think it is. And I think that's right. And I think this is the flip side of the sort of social movements that Tariq was talking more approvingly of, you know, is that the idea, okay, so we want to, uh, this is a fundamental difference, I think, to some extent between what Nazila has said and what I uh, align myself more with and what Tariq has said, um, in that I think that, and the sort of secular is my support, treats people as um, individuals who are the bearers of human rights which apply universally and one of those rights is to be able to have freedom of thought conscience and religion or belief you know to the greatest extent compatible with the rights and freedoms of others as, as, as Nazila said you know that's got to be um, part of it too and I think that that is the unit the, the individual human being is the unit of that we should be using as the unit of our discussion here not groups because I think that complicates things um, and, and can lead to really inappropriate or patronizing 
uh, campaigns like World to Jab Day um, that can also do real damage. I think you should talk about, in that case, talk about an individual woman and the state not interfering with an individual woman's um, decision to wear X, Y, or Z, equally not prescribing um, religious dress and equally not proscribing religious dress. And if there are specific circumstances, as we're all familiar with, where certain jobs can't be carried out if um, there's a certain you know, barrier um, imposed by religious dress, that's a different matter. But the starting point should be the freedom of the individual and their human right, her human right, in this case, to freedom of religion or belief. That's what I think. Um, and, and, and many French secularists, of course, um, are disquieted by the sort of um, um, prescriptive uh, things that France does in the name of secularism. I mean, Barbaro, who, from whom I mainly take this definition of secularism, was one of those who thought that um, there should be a much more balanced approach when he was on a, the Commission on Secularism um, in France. Um, for example, making meal choices available in schools um, as uh, as a way of incorporating and accommodating and recognizing uh, people's different preferences. So I don't think it's the French government doesn't always, isn't always the best definer necessarily of what French secularism is, you know, as a tradition. Okay, uh, Tari, a brief response to this, and then I'm going to start yeah. asking more deep questions. Okay, very briefly. So I agree with um, what Andrew said about uh, fundamental right of uh, freedom to believe, to leave religion, to believe nothing, freedom of conscience and so on. And more generally, the importance of uh, individual rights properly defended by law and, and constitution. I think where I disagree is with the next step. And he says, oh, and that's it. There are no other uh, uh, groups, no, no other rights that pertain to any other unit other than the individual. Now, whether we call them rights or something else, I'm not too fussed about at this stage, but, but I do think it is important that our normative landscape is not reduced to individuals and individual rights. Groups exist in society and are the source of people's, uh, what they care about, uh, the significance of things in their life, their identities, their relations with each other. And of course, we mustn't have them separated off from each other, sometimes what's regard called the multiculturalism of mosaic. Uh, I, I'm not at all in favor of that, but I'm, nor am I in favor of reducing all uh, ethnic, racial, religious, gender, sexuality groups to individual rights as some Republicans and liberals want to do. Okay, well, let's take a question that follows up on this because I think it's an issue that's of real interest. Um, so speaker has to give their name. What would the panel say about religious minorities that make demands for comprehensive exemptions from the law, e.g. concerning education, planning laws? I'm guessing that could be Arabs and things for the um, Orthodox Jewish community. Uh, rejecting a recourse to the police on matters such as abuse of children or women. How does this fit a model of mutual autonomy as mentioned by Tariq um, Madud? I, I think definitely the last example that uh, I have heard this argument before that if there's child abuse, then first it should go to the unit of the, that religious community before it's, uh, you know, the authorities should not be alerted at that point. Well, I uh, think we that, found the Catholic and uh, Anglican churches yes. so that much other religions have used that. That certainly goes too far, but I agree with Tariq that freedom of religion or belief includes with others and in public. And in human rights, we also have minority rights, which of course is very cautiously worded about persons belonging to minorities, but we can't pretend that communities and belonging doesn't exist in society. But what we're trying to do is uh, allow and, and facilitate indeed belonging uh, and being part of communities, but not uh, for it not to go so far that it has a coercive effect on others or leads to discrimination against others. And I'm afraid this is going to be a constant back and forth. And, you know, the example of the hijab in when it goes to courts, let's say, uh, a Muslim girl uh, uh, defies the school uniform rules and then it, it goes to court. The, the first question is, why has it been suddenly taken to the Supreme Court? Why couldn't it be resolved locally? One of the reasons for that is that culture wars is that we elevate something rather than trying to deal with it at the local level wherever possible. Of course, sometimes they will go to court and those courts precisely look at whether the daughter was pressured by her father or her brother the context will matter. 
And I think at the international level, also context matters. So we're trying to maximize individual choice. Ultimately, there must be protections for the individuals, but individuals also belong. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I, I think it leads to a lot of complexity in the uh, US uh, judicial system where religions have human rights. I think that completely uh, changes exactly. <laughs> the playing field and makes it a lot more complicated. Can I bring up education? I oh, God, I'm sorry, Andrew. Well, I mean, I think it's just important to say I don't think that Tarek needs to import the concept of rights into his into his thinking about groups, because I think the right concept was the one he deployed at the beginning, which was the idea that groups and organisations should have enjoy some sort of recognition. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think that that's the language that it's best to talk about groups. And I don't think it's the right idea to extend um, the the notion of universal human rights to cover somehow groups, apart from to the limited extent that, of course, every human being has the right of association with another human being who has the right of association with them. I think that the important concept, I think, to, to defend what Tarek is saying is, is the, the idea of recognition. Now, I happen to also agree, disagree that the state should then go about recognizing um, particular uh, religion or belief groups for lots of other reasons, reasons that perhaps oh, we won't get into. But I think that it's recognition rather than rights that's the point, um, because it's, it's very difficult to adjudicate the idea of group rights um, I don't know how you would even even well, you start, start to because... get into things like Sharia courts, which is huge right. And the moment that one dissenter own. stands up to say, "Well, no, not me," what does that mean for the group? Who speaks for the group then? How can the group be legislated yeah. for? Let I don't think that. Yeah. So respond to this, and then here here is uh, a way of trying to meet you halfway, Andrew, uh, <laughs> between recognition and rights. I'm not saying it'll work in all cases, but nevertheless, I think this is quite an exemplary uh, way of looking at it. So. You recognize groups by allowing them to do certain things um, which other people are not allowed in, you know, in those contexts and so on. So let's take the case of Sikh men wearing turbans in contexts where other people are not allowed to wear a turban, say if their employer gives them a particular uniform and says, you must wear this. Um, so here, we could never come up with this idea that Sikh men can wear a turban without having some idea of a group, namely Sikhs. What is it to be a Sikh? What are their uh, requirements and obligations and so on? But the bearers of the rights are individual men, individual Sikhs who may choose to wear a turban or not choose to wear a turban. So we recognize the group because without that, the consequent right doesn't follow, but the bearers of the right are individuals. Oh, I disagree with that because I don't think you need to recognize group membership. I'm, I'm, I would give actually more extensive um, recognition to the individual's freedom of religion or belief than your example implies, because I say it doesn't matter if the man with the turban it can plead a group in support of his turban. It only matters that he in his conscience believes that it's part of his personal religion to wear the turban. And I would say that the state has a duty um, to extend to that man. Um, the maximum accommodation possible of his religion or belief up to the limits of the rights and freedoms of others, regardless of whether or not he is the only turban believing person in the world and there's no group attached to him or whether he's the member of a group. So I don't I think that... I think uh, I, I want okay, to make it... the final word on this. Samir, if I, if, I, if I could jump in yeah. on your shoes for one second. Um, of course, we have reasonable accommodation. And we make exemptions and we, we allow because of reasonable accommodation and it's all matters of conscience, whether religion or belief. Um, but I think what is more interesting is, um, do we make a difference between claims of conscience, whether religion or belief, or political thought? And I think this is where, you know, I think the line is actually conscience, that it's of a certain seriousness and cogency, and we give it a special attention. It doesn't mean we always accommodate it, but we try to give it um, a special attention and reasonably accommodate it. But we don't do quite the same with political thought, unless that has become of such seriousness and cogency and coherence for the person that it becomes a matter of conscience. Okay, thank so you. I, think well, that's I, want to, like, I want to move on to education, which is such 
um, a controversial area when we try and think of, um, you know, a, a secular state. Um, is Carol Broom's question. Enforcing Christian worship as part of school assemblies is something I was bitterly opposed to throughout school and cemented my belief in atheism. Shoving religion down people's throats is totally unacceptable. And Tim McGarry, who's from Belfast, where we know a uh, religious divide is very tied up with kind of political divisions. How do humanists argue against the right of religions to educate their children in faith schools? And I would just add for those who are not UK based, we're in a strange situation where the UK in many ways seems to feel like a secular state, but many schools are actually run by religious organisations. Um, and in the United States, where schools, certainly you know, state schools are all secular, religion seems to have a very, very strong um, role in public life. What are your thoughts on the issue of education and secularism? Um, okay, I'll, I'll All go, right, for go for it. it. <laughs> uh, so, I think that a sc the school should not be thought of as simply a state institution. So, we send our children to school and the school becomes a loco parentis. So they look after our children, they educate our children, they um, you know, teach them various values and uh, how to relate to each other and so on. And, and obviously that's a very good thing. Um, and this is compulsory. If you don't do it, you can end up in prison. Of course, at the moment we're having homeschooling, but you, you, you'll understand my point. So where there's a kind of compulsive loco parentis, parents should have some discretion on what takes place in that institution. It's a state institution funded out of the common uh, tax, but nevertheless, um, parents should have some say. What kind of say? Well, one of the things I think parents should be able to do is to uh, ask the school that the school uh, time or the school premises can be used for religious instruction and uh, religious worship. This doesn't have to be a curriculum lesson. It could be in the lunch hour, it could be after school, it could be before school or whatever. So it's not like the statutory Christian assembly, but it, it could be. I'm, I'm not saying it, it never could be. Well, I'm saying it doesn't have to be. So I think parents have, have a right to ask that. Of course, children should be able to make their own uh, decision at a certain age um, as well. Um, but schools need to teach religious education as a serious subject. Why not can't ju they just teach religious education by allocating appropriate balance to the range, including non-humanist beliefs, which for, I mean, I should say I was on um, an RE council panel that came up with suggestions for government a couple of years ago. We specifically recommended the inclusion of non-religious beliefs. Yeah. Wouldn't that be the solution to parents who are concerned about um, their children being given only one religion as the main yeah. one and everything else is an extra? Or indeed parents who object to the yes. idea that religion is something their children should be taught? Yes, Samira, I, I think um, atheism, humanism, should be included in religious education classes mm -hmm. because this is part of what religion's about. People, uh, as we heard an, uh, an example, you know, from the questioner, someone who came to reject uh, their religion or belief in God as a result of religious instruction classes or, or morning assembly worship and so on. So of course, atheism and religion are tied up together. So. If of course, atheism and humanism and the dialectic between different religious traditions, you know, so you have obviously Christian humanism, Muslim sure, humanism, sure, sure. So Let me bring all, in the all this should be yes. taught, but, but I, I must just emphasize that that is, um, that the two things I'm saying are complementary. I'm not mm. favoring one at the exclusion of the other. So religious instruction at parental or children's request at some point in the school day, though not necessarily as a curriculum subject, and, and of course attendance should be voluntary, and then compulsory school subject called religious education, where religion is taught historically, sociologically, sure, sure, sure. theologically, just time, et cetera. Tariq, I, I just want to move on. So um, who wants to respond to that first? Because I think 
that's quite something to talk about religious instruction taking place in school separate to religious education Was well it would be pro no, it would be progress so. sorry it, it would yeah. be progress compared with what happens in england in the moment which mm. is that the schools where there is religious instruction don't have to have any balanced religious education to, to supplement it T Tarek and i think are quite probably closer together in our positions on this than it might appear when we were both commissioners on the Commission on Religion and Belief in British Public Life, which also made recommendations like your commission did, Samira, about <laughs> um, how RE should change. I think that we found that actually most people we consulted across the country of various different religions and beliefs actually had pretty coherent and consistent ideas about how this country at least should make progress in this area. And it was that there should be in all schools, which there isn't at the moment, um, a curriculum of balanced, broad, objective, inclusive teaching about religions and worldviews, including non-religious worldviews, and that's what our commission recommended, certainly. But that, and this is where I begin to lose, uh, not quite so, so supportive of this idea, but as well as that schools were community institutions which could make available space and possibly time um, for religion-specific teaching um, within school premises. And that, if that happened at every school in this country, for me, that would be a net gain um, of secularism because it would mean that the schools that currently didn't have any balanced teaching gained it. Um, and parents and children, and children specifically, who wanted to worship in their own particular way on school premises or have lessons about their own particular religion um, that they might want to choose would, have, would be allowed. And I can't so much see a problem um, with that. It is the way that some secular states that you would call more secular than, than, than England, like, for example, the Netherlands or parts of Germany, do conduct their education. Well, I want to move um, on systems. to those examples next, but Nazina, did you want to comment on this issue? Well, I think at the international level, we might say that there's the example of um, very strict neutrality. So we are so cautious that nothing gets taught in schools, <laughs> you know, that if it's publicly funded, then we have to be super cautious and keep it absolutely neutral. Another is that you have whatever system that is uh, historically provided in that country and there's an opt out for parents or children um, that uh, you know, they can opt out of that instruction. But I, I'm also leaning much more in favor of an openness and a diversity. I don't think uh, I agree that it would be religious instruction, but it's preparation for living in uh, the, the societies that we have that are very diverse. So knowledge of uh, a, a working knowledge of religion or belief and those that live, live around us. But I, I, I think I'm not convinced that it needs to be religious instruction. Excellent, thank you. I want to read just a couple of uh, comment style questions just that respond a bit to the discussion we just had on this topic. Uh, Paul Kay was talking about uh, the possible role of critical thinking logic and ep epistemology um, in the curriculum and whether it would be part of helping us reach a balanced secular society. I think the answer is yes. Um, so I'm going to answer on behalf of the panel. Um, and Kevin it says, to teach religion without including atheism, humanism, etc., is tyranny. I want to bring up an issue which we sort of just about got to, which is how some other countries deal with it, especially in Northern Europe. And going back up high, I noticed Julian Bagini, who I've interviewed before, and I may have got your surname wrong. Is it Bagini? Bagini is right. Bagini is right. Thank you, uh, Julian. I the desire says the desire for nations to champion their historical traditions seems to be very strong. In Norway, taxes go to the Protestant Church by default, but you can choose to give it to, say, a humanist organisation. And I think that's true in Germany, where the of course Parts the of Germany, yeah. on the right to be classed as religion and get their tithes. Um, are mechanisms like this ways to combine both state neutrality and respect? For the most dominant traditions, cake and eat it secularism. Good question. It it sort of depends how it all ends, doesn't it? Because you, there is a, there is a pl plausible narrative that you know to to have changed from being a um, single church establishment state to being a state where there is a recognition of plural um, organisations of the sort that Tarek um, uh, sort of described in theory at the beginning of his talk is a sort of progress. I, I would like it to be a progress towards a situation where ultimately um, none of those organisations were so recognised or privileged. And I think that because um, I, I think they have good reasons for thinking that, because I think that to allocate people to particular uh, divisions in life, you know, ossifies those distinctions, privileges um, the distinctions that have come to us from history rather than allowing the uh, freedom of uh, dissent and um, the dynamism of, of, of human thought that would perhaps reject categories and, and, and move on. Um, but I suppose in somewhere like Norway that has gone from being a Lutheran state to a state where 
the humanists, the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Catholics are co-established almost with the Lutheran church. I can see how some people would see that as progress. It's worth noting that the Norwegian Humanist Association that benefits enormously financially from this arrangement in Norway and is the largest humanist association in the world, even with the small population that Norway has as a result, at the same time as benefiting financially from this system, does want to see it end and would like to see that system um, uh, you know, change to a, a fully uh, secular state. Um, and I think some, some religious people who also benefit from, from it would like it too. So I think it depends on the on how wide you draw your timescale. If it's if it's if it's better than what went before it, then it's by definition progress. But I I wouldn't want to introduce. I wouldn't want France, for example, to, to become like Norway now is because then that would be a retrograde step. And you but it's certainly issue of hmm. smaller religions which will feel that smaller they get religions out a, by a exactly. Kind of, you know, there's a high threshold, you know. Exactly. There's a big was a big debate for many years in in Belgium, which has a similar system of um, parallel state recognition. Um, a big debate for many years um, in Belgium about whether or not Buddhists could be accepted as part of the state. And I think that's a humiliating and um, degrading sort of uh, process as a person of any religion or belief to have to involve yourself in. Um, but it is. Uh, the, the necessary consequence of, of a state that does deal out recognition in that way. And I can't see how it's that different from France demanding that mosques conform. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still uh, a sort of state regulation of religion that I would find unacceptable. Yeah, no, I think, I think it is, it is a, it, agree. Uh, there are all kinds of <laughs> concerns about it. Um, I'll take brief responses on this too from, you know, Nazila, you were going to speak and then Tariq as well on the, the sort of, if you can call it the Norwegian model, but the idea of the the automatic kind of allocation of funds that you can then opt to give elsewhere. Well, also there was the bigger question about um, respecting the majority. And I wanted to question that and say, actually in human rights, we look at protections for the minority because the public culture, the media society does not, is not already deeply infused in those, uh, that knowledge base and those cultural values. So we, we actually want to level the playing field for minorities to allow them to exist, to allow them to continue. So this idea of um, respect for the majority is kind of uh, idiosyncratic, if you like. Um, when it comes to, I think there's a distinction between registration and recognition. In many parts of the world, religion and belief communities need registration in order to hire a whole, in order to, um, be able to carry out charitable activities, even in order to be able to meet. But we need to make a distinction between that, you know, of course, in the UK, we do it through ch the, the Charity Commission, and it's a more general system of uh, allowing those activities and, and that legal existence to be able to carry out community activities. But that's very different to recognition. And um, Tarek? Yeah, so I'm not so... Um against the idea of respect for the majority. Of course, multiculturalism is about protecting minorities. And as Nazila says, making sure that minorities enjoy some of the benefits or at least aren't disadvantaged by a dominant or a domineering majority. And, and this can happen you know, unintentionally. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be the majority trying to do it. But I've... Uh, I come to the view that recognition needs to be reciprocal, needs to be mutual in the kind of diversity we now have. And this is part of uh, a response, you know, to the kind of cultural war situations where majorities, at least sometimes, uh, can have genuine grievances or at least need to be heard about what is uh, worrying them. As for the issue about the, uh, the Norwegian model versus the French model, aren't they the same once the state is involved? What, you know, why is it uh, wrong? It's no worse, I thought I, Andrew was saying, for uh, President Macron to say how mosques should be run than it is for the uh, Norwegian state to support a thresh, uh, slate of religions and so on. Well, I think, yes, it, 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 there's a big difference. Of course, you can have authoritarian state domination of the majority religion, let alone minority religions and so on, just because mo uh, moderate, multi moderate secularism in the way I described it consists of state religion connections, doesn't mean that any connections 
are as good or as bad as each other. I certainly don't hold that view. And the problem about, well, what is the threshold and who decides and is it, isn't it an invidious process, deciding and so on. I think this is just a practical reality. I mean, if we think of, we, of our, what we call democratic systems, they all have a certain threshold before a group can have a view represented in, in the legislature or somewhere. However, that threshold is constructed. Sometimes it's officially, you know, you have to get 5% of the vote or something. And other times we have first past the post system like here, which is designed in such a way as to leave some people with no chance of being represented. So but I think, I think we, yeah, so what exactly? Nancy I mean, can Nancy they right, marry? Can cost? they bury? Can they meet? Can they uh, yeah, bring up their children in their tradition? So yes, you know. of course. Sorry, no. Um, state um, recognition um, usually. I, I don't know very well the Norway case, but you know a, a number of different cases. Say Denmark. Um, you you have state recognition of religion that does give you certain entitlements and access to, for instance, uh, uh, educational funds. But that's not the same thing as recognizing uh, a religion as an association which uh, can do various things. Now, uh, in terms of marriage, well, I mean, the, the, the state has a, a, a minimum civil uh, marriage arrangement and religious groups might want to add something to it, but they can't detract from it. They can't say, oh, we don't recognize civil religion as involving what you say it does uh, because our religious tradition is that marriage is something other than that. Uh, I mean, polygamy would be, would, be, would be an example. So if a religious tradition said we uh, believe in polygamy and so on, they would have to debate this uh, in, in public and, and try and get the law changed. It wouldn't be enough just to say, oh, we're Muslims, therefore we have a right, uh, you know, a legitimate right to do it. Okay, uh, because we're into the last 10 minutes now, I was trying to think of, of sort of a couple of issues that are being raised that would sort of draw us to a close. Um, and I wonder actually, maybe there is only a very brief answer, is how far the pandemic has changed the situation in terms of campaigning for humanism and secularism. It certainly feels in so many other arenas that it to some extent be an excuse to push lots of issues off the agenda and is of great concern, especially given that it does look as if we'll be living with aspects of COVID-19 for a long time. What are your thoughts on this? I think the pandemic has had an, a, a, a devastating effect on freedom of religion or belief internationally, um, mostly because it's uh, exacerbated state persecution of people who were already um, scapegoated, uh, marginalised. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, not you know non-religious people are Muslims in India, or um, humanists in uh, Pakistan or Nigeria. Um, bo both have been subject um, to uh, heightened persecution during this period, Christians as well in, in various countries that we were hearing about in Parliament just a, just a couple of weeks ago. So it's exacerbated, but that's because the pandemic has exacerbated all human vi rights violations everywhere um, yeah. as governments have taken the, the opportunity, you know, repressive governments have taken the opportunity while no one's looking or people are, um, are busy um, to clamp down on people that they were already uh, clamping down on, um, I think. It's also raised practical problems, of course, for people who... Um, in, in, in situations of mass casualties haven't had the opportunity to, to have the funeral arrangements that they um, might want. Um, that's happened even in the UK with people wanting humanist funerals and not being able to get them or wanting to be um, buried and having to be cremated or you know, so on and, and so forth. But really I think it's, it's governments that have used, the, the, for whom the pandemic's been an incredible opportunity to just increase their persecution of people while no one's watching. I mean, and Nazila will know more, more, more about that yeah. because it's, it's in the freedom of conscience that it's been particularly severe. Nazila, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, I was waiting, Andrew, if you had a sort of a humanist particular account, <laughs> but, uh, but absolutely what you describe as being tr true for the pandemic. Um, and, you know, something that I was expecting to see in the UK that I haven't seen yet is that, well, of course, the government has said, you know, periods of the pandemic, 
places of worship were open. And I was waiting for a place of worship to say, I open my doors on a Wednesday to other groups or on a Thursday to other groups. And we know that you don't, in, that minority communities, smaller communities do not have registered places of worship. And I was really hoping somebody would take that step, but I never saw that. And that's, that's unfortunate because the pandemic has also um, built community solidarity and people are more able to ask for help and offer help. And I'm, you know, I, I want to see narratives at the community level that have um, been positive, but yes, let's wait to see if, if uh, you know, places of worship will open their doors to others to come and enjoy that benefit. Um, there's one question that I think is a good general one to draw us all towards a close, which is from John Bishop. Um, for all the speakers, can we measure the progress of secularism? If we can, how and who might undertake that work on a sustainable basis? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Is it, different? Is it different to a comprehensive freedom of re religion or belief analysis? You know, <laughs> it, it raises... Um, the hard, some of, in some parts of the world, it's the hardest questions regarding the limits of freedom of religion or belief that uh, humanism would rise. But I'm interested to know if, if they will be different. You know, I think secularity, secularism, the secular nature of the state or not, is something different from simply maximal freedom of religion or belief, because it, it's mm -hmm. a commitment that's a political commitment as well as a human rights commitment. It includes the idea that, you know, there is just something... Um, both in principle wrong and in practice that will always be um, negative of entwining religion with state institutions. So I think separation is such a, um, a vital additional part of secularism, including freedom of thought and conscience and religion of belief, that the two analyses would probably be different. Jonathan Fox, I forget his university, it's somewhere in Israel, of course, has attempted to produce, but it's a bit like a sort of utopian project to try and even do the analysis, has attempted to produce this comprehensive sort of numbered system where he can rank countries by secularity. I think it's probably more uh, more difficult than, than that. Uh, not Who, least because- do, do you know who's top on his list, even if it is- I think it isn't it, isn't it Sweden? I think it might be Sweden. Um, okay. I, Sorry, I don't. I, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not exactly. In, uh, the distribution of countries on his scale isn't, you know, far fetched. It's just that the idea that you can add a number to everything and then catalogue it, I think, just doesn't give due respect to the sort of qualitative nature of people's experience in these in these societies. But apart from anything else, Nigeria on paper is a wonderful secular state. But in reality, you know, that, that doesn't happen at all. You know, the, the state, even if it wanted to be secular, couldn't enforce its secular laws in Kano state. You know, the, Abuja couldn't, um, it, it, their writ doesn't run that far. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to draw, a, um, to measure um, really progress in that, in that sense. And of but course, secularists we, can never agree what progress is either. But if we do, that, at least we should not look just at uh, theoretical models. We should look at enjoyment in practice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Tariq, what about you? How would you measure secularism? Um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I don't work with um, these large data sets that measure attitudes and values. So I, I think my answer would be very similar to what uh, Andrew and Nazila have already said to the, to the last two questions. But perhaps my closing uh, short remark in relation to the other question uh, about the pandemic and so on mm -hmm. is, I don't know whether pandemics had any direct influence uh, on uh, governmental and policy issues regarding humanism, but the thought that um, occurs to me uh, quite a lot in our kind of gloomy predicament is what the effect will be, if there will be one, on on belief, uh, for instance. So will people take the view, I mean, uh, death, I think, is a great source of religious belief, the prospect of death. So, uh, and grief, obviously, is, a, is one of the heightened religious moments that people have as individuals and as families and communities and so on. So will that mean that there will be a kind of uh, a stimulus to religious feeling or the opposite. People think, well, my goodness, how can I believe in a God when, mm, you know- So you've raised you, another question really. Yeah, so it, it, it's nothing to do with policy and government, <laughs> but it is, a, it is something I think about, uh, about where we're going 
in the future in relation to humanist belief versus religious belief? Well, in the last minute we have, someone has raised the issue of whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic. Andrew, in final word to you, is there a, a thought about people who, everyone here in this conversation is interested in um, secularism, and I would guess on the whole interested in its strength um, and, and it is a positive force. So what would you say, um, are you optimistic? Is there anything people could take away from this that they could perhaps in their own way be doing? I think that it's, you have to think short term and then longer term. And I think in the short term, there are reasons to be quite pessimistic. I mean, the, the religion and belief groups are, are, are facing in many countries increased persecution from governments that increasingly ally themselves with a, a religious form of ethnic nationalism. That's happening increasingly. And I poured some cold water on Jonathan Fox's analysis a moment ago in terms of his ranking of states as to how secular they were. But um, one thing he has mapped is the change over a 10 year period between whether states are less secular now than they were or more secular. And his his analysis shows, and I think it's plausible that there has been a movement away from uh, formal secularism and in practice secularism and towards um, religious government and religious politics. I don't think that that, that short term uh, trend will necessarily continue mostly because I think that the the it, it's it's a symptom of a longer term trend which is more um, optimistic. You know, the reason why religious minorities are increasingly persecuted in many parts of the world, let's take humanists in Malaysia for example, the reasons why humanists in Malaysia are persecuted today is because they exist and they're visible and growing freedom of conscience and the possibility of um, social media and contact and networking and growth has made the idea of being a humanist in Malaysia possible. So they're persecuted now because they exist. They weren't persecuted in the past because they didn't exist. So I think there's an underlying trend where, which probably is a sort of the biggest struggle for human freedom um, that will eventually, as a result of my probably optimistic spirit rather than any data, um, I believe will sort of play out in, in, in a positive way in the long term. That's what I think. But it's based, the optimism is based on nothing, unfortunately. It's only the pessimism in the short term that's based on data. <laughs> in a sense, pessimism is how we're all living in the short term because that's what the pandemic has done. And that's optimism true. is in the long term. So it's not a bad way to, to be thinking. Um, I'd like to thank all of you, Andrew Copson, Tarek Madud, and Nazila Ghania, uh, for thoughtful and, and, you know, really, God, quite, I'm quite. Uh, my mind is kind of uh, bubbling with all these different ways of seeing things. Thank you for the brilliant discussion that's been taking place on the, uh, the q and I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all the questions, but I think we tried to cover a lot of the big issues. A reminder that Darwin Day is um, a big event uh, for Humanists UK. Um, it's on the 12th of February. It's Oliver, Scott, Curry, and it'll be chaired by Alice Roberts. So I hope you can um, join us then. And in the meantime, thank you all for being here. Um, take care of yourselves. And... Yeah, thank you again to my panelists. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.